Judge, you were a sitting district attorney at the time of the murders. When you first watched this case unfold, did you think it would be a slam dunk or did you anticipate the uphill battle that the prosecution would go on to have? You know, when you look at this case uh, as a prosecutor and you've got the motive, you've got the means, you've got the opportunity, the old fashioned, you know, uh, equation that we use, if it were anyone other than O.J. Simpson, I would say, you know, there's a good chance to get an elect uh, to get a conviction here. But but rarely do I say something is a slam dunk. I've learned after three and a half decades, you never say that. But I, there, there was this disconnect between the public's understanding of what happened here and their impression of O.J. Simpson. So that kind of complicated things. And then things were also complicated by the fact that there was a lot of issues regarding race going on at the time, Rodney King, and there were a lot of other issues that play outside the courtroom, but impact the courtroom. So never a slam dunk, probably should have been simpler, but the times made it a little different. And so, all right, picking up on sort of the racial undertone point here, a controversial part of the trial was the recorded conversations of then LAPD detective Mark Furman. Yes. How did those tapes force the spotlight on those racial undertones that characterized the trial? Well, you know, Mark Furman was an excellent detective. He was a veteran detective. He had a lot of years of experience. Uh, and what those tapes did was pretty much shock everyone and we knew that all of a sudden there was this 300-pound gorilla in the case that didn't belong there. It didn't need to be there. But that was going to change everything about this trial. And the fear was that that racial component that would play right into what was going on in Los Angeles at the time uh, would have a tremendous impact in the courtroom. And it did. It did. Another one being domestic violence. Marsha Clark wanted to center the case as a domestic violence case, which at the time, that phrase wasn't even used. Yeah. Why didn't this approach have more of an impact with the jurors, do you think? You know, this was not really seen as a domestic violence case. I mean, I started the first domestic violence unit in the country in 1978. Uh, as a young prosecutor. And so, I mean, domestic violence had been around for a long time, but California was one of those states that was kind of late to the dance. Mm -hmm. uh, if you, it was against the law to beat your wife in the state of California uh, after 10 p.m. And the thinking was that it would disturb the public quiet and the ability of people to get us, uh, you know, to be able to sleep. So California was late to the game, but this was 93, 94, I should say. And, uh, you know, so domestic violence was well known. It was not a term that was used frequently at the trial. This was just seen as a bloody homicide. Uh, and what kind of took it out of the domestic violence sphere was um, the young man who was with uh, Nicole Brown Simpson. And so people then kind of saw it as, gee, maybe that was a motivation, which would, you would think would feed into the domestic violence argument, but at the same time kind of took it out of that domestic violence kind of category in a lot of people's minds because it was early. It was, it was the early 90s, and so people weren't real comfortable with that. And also sort of new on the scene at that time was DNA evidence. It was mm. relatively new as a scientific development at the time. Now, mm. OJ's blood was found in the Bronco on a pair of his socks, on those infamous gloves, even at the scene of the crime. And the prosecution aimed to use this as proof that he was the murderer. But what happened? What happened was that uh, they, they used the uh, Mark Furman tape and what was going on in Los Angeles at the time, the racial component as a claim that they were framing O.J. Simpson. So they were able to use something within the trial, and that was the tapes done by uh, Mark Furman. Uh, they saw him as a racist, and therefore they were going to frame this black guy. And that going on with, you know, the unsettling racial issues going on in Los Angeles at the time, a jury of, you know, six African-American women. And, you know, there was a lot of upset. One of the biggest problems in the case, as I recall, was that the D.A. Gil Garcetti uh, was so confident in his case that he made the decision to keep it in Long uh, in in Los uh, Los Angeles as opposed to moving it with a change of venue. 
Um, he was very confident, and that was a mistake that he made. And they could have moved the trial. There was agreement. But he said, no, you know, it'll be fine. So also something that I think remains controversial to this day, potentially, is the judge, Judge Lance Ito, uh, his decision to allow the trial to be televised. Yeah. What are your thoughts on the trial becoming the media spectacle that it is remembered as today? The O.J. Simpson case was one of the first cases televised, uh, and everybody had an opinion as to whether or not uh, trials should be televised. I have always felt that a trial is a public it's a public event. I mean, you know, from the time of the, you know, in the village and the town square, everybody could go to the courthouse. Everybody could watch these cases. And as the world got bigger and more technological, the only way to be in that town square or the forum was to actually have a camera in the courtroom. Even as a judge, I was in favor of cameras in the courtroom. There, the, the, Some of the reluctance I had had to do with children, young children, and having an exception in cases that were especially traumatic for the victims. Obviously, people play to cameras. Some of them do. Some of them forget the cameras even there. So it was a question of how obtrusive it would be and whether people would be playing to it. This case took a lot longer than it should than it should have. And Judge Ito, I, I remember the big joke was the dancing Itos. They made the judge. I mean, I don't qu even remember now why they called him the dancing Ito. Um, he was a little, I think, uh, beyond what he was capable of in that courtroom. But... Um, in the end, I see this as a good thing because it started all of this interest in criminal justice, which at that point has been, had been my life for almost two decades. Uh, and it was something that brought the public into the crime thing. And then we saw these real true crime stories and all that other stuff come, come into the fore. Before that, it was a very small piece of, you know, the, the public you know, information as to what you could get involved in. You know, there was cars and there was celebrities and there was this and that. But now everybody was into what I loved, which was, you know, crime, law enforcement and the ability to solve crime. Uh, so being on television, I thought was a good thing. I also thought it was a good thing so that the the, the public hearing about, you know, these prejudiced Los Angeles cops could actually see them on the stand, listen to them, watch their demeanor. I mean, for what um, Mark Furman said on those tapes, he was still an excellent cop. You couldn't take that from him. But he watered down the whole message and heard the trial. And at the end of the day, you know, to your point, so that's what America was watching, but what mattered was what the jury was watching. So what are your thoughts? You know, the jury deliberated for less than four hours. What are your thoughts on, at the time, first of all, did you think that they, when you heard that a verdict had been reached, did you think it was not guilty or did you think it was going to be a conviction? And what's your analysis on the, the jury makeup at the time? You know, I would have to look back. I remember that I I had done television on this virtually every night. Uh, and Geraldo Rivera was one of the first with something called Rivera Live. I think it was on CNBC. And um, it was something that I was very connected to. And I remember thinking that they had a great case. Uh, they had a dream team. But I remember being so impressed with Marsha Clark. She was a very impressive prosecutor, very quick, very knowledgeable. Uh, I was very proud of her because it was the early 90s and not that many women were out there trying homicide cases. And uh, so I remember sitting at CNN with a couple of other of the, you know, talking heads and the verdict came in. And as always, I accept the jury verdict. I don't criticize it. I don't, you know, it's not up to me. The jury made the decision that they felt was the right decision. I couldn't help but think, though, when they said not guilty that, you know, if the, if the glove doesn't fit, you must acquit nonsense. And, you know, I grew up in upstate New York. I don't know if you know anything about upstate New York, but by pretty much by Halloween, you had to wear a winter coat. And I remember that day because I could never you wear my costumes. It was always a coat over. It was always snowing. So I knew that if the, if the, blood, if the glove were wet, the blood would shrink the glove. And so any leather glove that gets wet shrinks. And so I knew that whole thing was ridiculous. And I did not know it at the time. But subsequently, we came to find out that 
O.J. Simpson was told to get off his arthritis medication so that, you know, his arthritis was even more pronounced and his hands were even bigger than they may have been at the time. Um, I, I disagreed with the verdict. I accepted it. it was the right verdict based upon these people who heard the evidence. But I also think that there were so many other emotions going on in America, so many other things playing that um, this jury of six African-American women and two African-American men, I mean, that's the majority of 12. You know, if this was... Uh, two people basically paying for the sins of their fathers, that we were going to make sure that a black man was not prosecuted and convicted because of all the racism in, in America. And, you know, the, 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 the brunt of it, obviously, being brought against African-American men, they were willing to let him go because of all of the past misdeeds. So, um, Look, it was it was a difficult time. It was a case that I thought they proved beyond a reasonable doubt what happened. But again, I accept it. Do you feel that the racial undertones, the weight that the racial climate, the Rodney King trial, the Rodney King beating, the Watts riots, everything, that that outweighed, let's say if we went back in time, I mean, it's a hypo, but, and all the evidence of the domestic violence was presented, do you feel still that he would have been acquitted, that the the racial undercurrent essentially was such a tidal wave, it would have subsumed even the incontrovertible and overwhelming evidence of her terrible, violent situation um, that she was in? I think that she was not really portrayed as a battered woman. And so that kind of got downplayed. And I, I remember, because you know, domestic violence was my, was my expertise in the DA's office, and the, the role that I played... Uh, nationally in getting other DA's offices through the Department of Justice to set up domestic violence units. To me, that was the, that was the issue, mm-hmm. but it wasn't to the country. Now, what's mm-hmm. your, what are your thoughts on domestic violence as an issue in the current criminal justice system? You know, what I've seen uh, in the, how many years since I started, 78, 88, 98, 2008, 2008 40 years ago, um, what I've seen is that now women were primarily in 90, 95% of the cases, the victims. Now we're seeing more men who are, who are admitting that they've been victims or we're seeing, um, you know, women and men kind of engaging in it like a mutual combat thing. And I fought for laws at the time that it really wasn't necessarily you know, who won and who didn't win as to who the abuser was, but rather who instigated and who started the abuse. So if a man is beating a woman and she finally grabs something to defend herself, to me, that was a test. You know, it really is the primary aggressor uh, statutes in New York and across the country. And it was the reasonable man uh, standard that they would use in domestic violence homicides. But we had to kind of really fight in court to have it be the reasonable woman, the reasonable person. You know, that at some point, the woman who's battered so much for so long believes she has no way out. And so she takes the law into her own hands. So, you know, it's more than just the jury not accepting it. It was getting the judges to accept it, getting the laws to change, getting the victims the services that they needed to at least report a crime. And what I would do in these cases is I would say to the woman, uh, it's not you against your husband. It's me. It's the people of the state of New York against your husband. You got no say in this. So, um, and then we started getting convictions as opposed to the victim coming in and dropping. We wouldn't let her drop, just wouldn't let her drop the case. And so what you're seeing here is like the, the beginning. And Nicole Brown Simpson was almost robbed of that moniker if, as if, you know, it's kind of sad, but that's what she was, a battered woman. When you watched this as a prosecutor, were there any other significant moments that marked a key turning point for you? The use of DNA, uh, it was new at the time. Uh, I was familiar with it from using it as a DA in my office. Uh, But I think that one of the most significant things was the fact that um, we had expert witnesses, uh, the prosecutor had expert witnesses that made out a case. But 
that the jurors were not yet comfortable with the science. And so what was a, you know, dead to right to me as a prosecutor or to a scientist who understood DNA, a lot of people were like, you know, is this kind of fuzzy math? What is this DNA stuff? You know, I always said when it came out, I remember in 80, 1986 it came out, and I remember saying it's the finger of God pointing down and saying, you did it or you didn't do it based upon DNA. I don't believe that the jury was felt it was as compelling as those of us who were used to using DNA felt it was. Um, and I also think that um, the O.J. Simpson, you know, a year in that courtroom or however long it was, it was very, it was months and months, uh, smiling, laughing, jokes, you know, the extended trial. I mean, I just remember saying at one point to myself, they're like family now, the jury and the defendant. You know, it's uh, everyone was afraid to kind of go above and beyond uh, because of what Mark Furman had done. You know, so they, they couldn't get the final, you know, this is it. There's no question about it. Uh, but you might want to ask Marsha Clark that question. I'll bet she's in a better position than I. What I do remember is I had just become the DA and it was the summer, June of uh, 1994, and one of my prosecutors came out, he said, boss, he said, you're not going to believe this, but O.J. Simpson's in a white Bronco and the cops are chasing him. And we were all like, what? And so a few of us went inside and then, you know, it was like 150 of us. And then and then we went to the bigger room with the bigger television at my house. And I said, and a lot of the prosecutors said the same thing, that's consciousness of guilt. Mm -hmm. He was taking off because it was consciousness of guilt. That never entered into the picture. It was like, eh, that's just OJ, you know, he just wants to kill himself. He feels so bad for Nicole. They didn't see it as consciousness of guilt. He's trying to get away. He doesn't want to go to the police department. He was supposed to go to the police department. So, yeah, those two things. How would you have prosecuted this case differently, Judge? I wouldn't have. I think I think the LADA's office did a great job. I think a, a couple of things. I think that OJ was even more loved in Los Angeles than, you know, in other parts of the country. And I also think that the the racial unrest in California impacted it. So I would never say the prosecution didn't do a great job. Um, and, and by the way, as much as I fought with people like Johnny Cochran and Alan Dershowitz, who was in that, and Shapiro, and, um, and even F. Lee Bailey, um, I became friends with all of them because, you know, we were, we, everybody was fighting the good fight. And the DA's office didn't go out uh, where the defense attorneys might go out. And so they had people like us go out there. And so many people who were lawyers at the time went into television and got their start. I stayed where I was, you know, for another, I don't know, 12, 12, 14, I don't know, 18 years, whatever it was, uh, because I loved what I did. But it was very interesting. Um, they did a good job. They couldn't win it kind of reminds me of a case in New York where the individual might have been acquitted somewhere else, but he was in Manhattan, so it wasn't going to happen. 